Hello everyone, my name is Paul from Guitar Gear Connection, and welcome to this episode of All About, where we're going to be discussing the Vox AC100, the amplifier built to combat against the screaming girls of the 1960s. But before we do, a special thanks goes out to voxac100.org.uk and Vox Amplifiers The JMI Years by Jim Elliott. If it wasn't for these two resources, this video would not have been possible. So without further ado, let's get into the history of the AC-100. The first mention of the 100 watt amp was on October 24th, 1963 in a Music Trade Press article. Early versions were called AC-80 100s due to them only producing 80 watts of clean power. Testing of the amps was completed at the end of September 1963. The amp was even the talk of the town, since it was so loud during testing, neighbors would complain. Paul McCartney was the first to receive the amp in the last few days of 1963, of course using it as a bass amp, pairing it with a 215 cab. The first advertisement of the amp was in Beat Monthly magazine. April of 1964. Around the same time, the amp started hitting catalogs, and most likely it was a build to order item. Three different speaker cabinet options were available a 215 cab for bass, an SDL option or Super Deluxe with 412 speakers and two Goodman mid axe horns for the guitar, and a foundation bass cab containing one 18-inch speaker, again used for bass. Early in 1965, main production was switched from Westerex in London to the Burn Depp facility on West Street in Erith, Kent, England. This switch was in preparation of the high demand the Beatles would generate while out on tour. By March of 1965, Burn Depp was in full production of the AC-100. Interestingly, many of the AC-100 seen by bands in 1965 would have been loans from JMI. Sales didn't start ramping up till mid-1965. Vox had a very successful run making roughly 2200 amps right up until the new JMI solid states in very late 67, or you could say right up until the end of JMI. No records of Vox Sound Equipment Limited or VSEL AC 100s exist. Up next is the generation changes of the amp. Some fine details have been left out. Those two resources I mentioned at the beginning of the video, please check them out for more. Early AC 80 slash 100s came through in what is referred to as thin edge head boxes that were 3 8 inch in thickness. These were made by a company called Gal Rev. Most would have had brown grill cloth material, though small numbers do exist in black. Early trolleys are easy to spot with their large top baskets. Copper colored top panels also were standard on early production amps. It is also important to note that these early amps all came through cathode bias, which is the way the amp controlled over the four EL34 tubes. Serial numbers ran from 101 to 219, even though Paul McCartney's was the first made with serial number 150B. The next change was serial 220 to 229. Everything stayed the same except for the introduction of what is referred to as thick edge head boxes being 5 8 inch in thickness. Serial number 230 to 300 is up next. The top panels now came through in black instead of the previous copper color. The beautiful basket top style trolleys were now replaced with the standard straight tube style tops. The transformers still made by Woden now are silver color instead of sea green. Dome shaped voltage regulator switches come in around serial number 260 replacing the older pin style. Up to about serial number 300 is where the switch from Westrex to Burn Depth occurred. 
The changeover is where the later cathode biased AC80 slash 100s now enter. Westrex's leftovers were being used while the burn depth facility prepared to take on full production. The C Green Woden transformers that were being used in earlier serial numbers now make another appearance. Gray panel tops appear around serial number 302, but get switched up to black every so often. Pin style voltage selectors come back for a few amps, but then go back to the dome style. This crazy time hit serial numbers 300 to 319. Serial number 320 is where burn depth had fully entered its production. A few changes were made, such as having a smaller choke, but now we also see the new standard of gray panels, dome voltage selectors, and silver Woden transformers. Serial numbers ran from 320 to 449. The next generation was the 100 watt amplifier at the end of May 1965. These amps were now fixed biased. Vox felt that the cathode biased amps were a ticking time bomb with how much heat it generated and with how much stress the components were going through. These new fixed bias amps not only ran cooler, but they also finally delivered the true 100 watts of power. For the most part, the rest of the amp didn't change much besides the new transformers and parts needed to make the new fixed bias circuit. Serial numbers ran from 450 to 724. The last generation is the AC100 Mark II, made from September 1965 to the amp's end in early 1968. Triumph Electronics did produce a few models as well, outside of the burn depth facility, but not many. Quite a few changes were made throughout this period. First is the introduction of the Burmister. This is a resistor that would allow only a small bit of current to the tubes when the amp was first turned on and gradually add more current as the resistor heated up, instead of all the power just rushing in. Red warning plaques started showing up, replacing the white with red lettering. The beginning of 1966 saw a metal guard around the EL34 tubes for heat reduction. Towards the end of production, two big final changes were made. First was the addition of two more filter capacitors in the power section to help cope with America's 120 volts. The last change was taking out one of the preamps ECC83 tubes and switching it to an ECC82 in hopes of more gain, but instead, this gave the amp the potential to make more of that annoying hum sound. These last two additions also called for a schematic change. Mark II serial numbers ran from 725 to the high 2200s, finishing off production. Overall, a very simple amplifier, especially in today's standards. Only one channel with volume, treble, and bass, with two input jacks. As mentioned, the cabinets came in three variations. Early two 15-inch cabs came with blue Celestian T1074s before switching to silver T1108s. The 412 cabs came through with two Goodman mid-axe horns paired with gray Celestian T1088s. Later cabs saw Goodman 241s and possibly a few saw Celestian T1225s. The 18 inch foundation cabs saw tons of different variations of speakers. Just to name a few, the blue Celestian T1022s and 1079s, the gray T1108s and T1296s, various Goodman audiums, and some came with the Fain 183s. It's also important to note that the amplifier should be run through a Variac if operated outside of the UK. The amps are tapped for 115 volt, 160, 205, 225, and 245. 
America's 120 volts causes the amp to run hotter and just plain overworked. Bringing the voltage down to even 110 will cause the amp to run cooler, happier, and sound even better. Now, of course, tons of bands back in the day used this beautiful amplifier. But to save time, I'm just going to list off a few for you. First up, The Beatles. Next, The Rolling Stones. Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas. The Dave Clock Five. The Kinks. The Yardbirds. Jeff Beck. Jerry and the Pacemakers, and a few bands even today still use the amp. One of those is my good friend, Jose Estragos. It's time for that part of the video you all skip forward to anyways, the sound demo. I'll be playing through my AC100, it is serial number 416, cathode bias, gray panel, gray Celestian T1088s with the two mid-axe horns. Thanks again for watching everybody. Please comment below, like and subscribe, check out my Instagram and Facebook for more, and please stick around, a lot more to come.